I'm Tom Shalou. I'm Sandra Smith. I'm Steve Ducey, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, March 11th, 2022. I'm Dave Anthony. It's two years to the day since COVID was declared a pandemic and the virus may never go away. I can guarantee you we are going to see an increase in COVID cases this fall, this coming fall. Why? Because COVID-19 is going to behave like the other respiratory viruses that circulate every single year. And Lisa Brady, record high gas prices aren't just a pain at the pump. They have a widespread impact on other costs, including for restaurants. I mean, today I bought everything from French fries to hush puppy mix. And it all plays into moving it from point A to point B. And I'm Carol Markowitz. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. It's now been two years since the World Health Organization proclaimed COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Later that same day, March 11th, President Trump addressed the nation. We will ultimately and expeditiously defeat this virus. He added Europe to his China travel ban. And we have issued guidance on school closures, social distancing and reducing large gatherings. And then, of course, came all the political battles over COVID restrictions, Zoom classrooms, masks and vaccines and mandates. But back to that day. Listen to the COVID numbers the head of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, cited. More than 118,000 cases and 4,291 people have lost their lives. We've now topped 6 million COVID deaths, almost a million of them here in the U.S., and more than 452 million infections globally. It was really remarkable. That was the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Marty McCary is a professor at Johns Hopkins University and a Fox News contributor. Yeah, if you think about the proportion of the population that's died from this infection, it is relatively similar to what we've seen in other pandemics in history. Uh, If you take, for example, in Mississippi, one in 200 adults have died from the COVID-19 pandemic. So it should be a reminder of how we need to have systems to be prepared and to move quickly. So the number one lesson, I think, over the last two years is we got to have our own American scientists on the ground doing the, doing research quickly so we can get answers. We didn't have a vaccine, of course, two years ago. That came a year later. Now we have about three quarters of U.S. adults fully vaccinated. And of those, about almost half have had boosters. What about those who are unvaccinated now, still two years in? Most of them have immunity from natural immunity from prior infection. But we have studied this at Johns Hopkins. And if you think you had COVID but have never had a documented positive test, you can't rely on thinking you had it. You really need to have documentation in order to trust that immunity to some degree. There are people who are still non-immune who are getting infected and getting into deep trouble. They are older people with multiple risk factors and they've not been vaccinated and they haven't had the infection. They're still showing up at the hospital, albeit at a slower rate. We're also seeing a little bit of an uptick right now in the UK, which tends to be a preview of what to expect in the US. And what we're seeing there is that older people, particularly in lower vaccinated regions where we think the booster utilization rate is lower in older people. They're coming into the hospital. We're seeing a bit of an uptick in new hospitalizations there. Cases have gone down a lot here in the U.S. since the record Omicron wave that we had in December and January. But when you look at these waves, when you look at the graph on your Johns Hopkins COVID-19 dashboard, you can see we had that spike up in the spring of 2020, went down. Summer, back up, down. Then fall and winter into 2021, we had a record at that time of cases. Then it went down. President Biden declared independence from COVID around July 4th. And then, boom, we got hit by Delta. And then, boom, we got hit by Omicron. Are we going to have another wave, in your view, at some point as we get to summer, as we get to fall and winter? Probably not the likes of which we've seen over the last two years. I can guarantee you we are going to see an increase in COVID cases this fall, this coming fall. Why? Because COVID-19 is going to behave like the other 
respiratory viruses that circulate every single year. Now, anything is possible. We can see an outbreak among an animal species where we believe in the animal kingdom. There's a reservoir of virus that can replicate and mutate and then cross over to humans. That's possible. But as of now, I don't think there's anything we need to worry about in terms of another surge, the likes of which we just went through. COVID is going to be like our flu and cold, right? We just deal with it every year. So this COVID-19 virus has a stigma for good reasons. We've been burned living through the last two years. But let's remember, there's a host of respiratory viruses that we have to learn to live with. And what I mean by that is some basic principles. If you are exposed to someone, wear a high quality mask for a period of time. If you are sick, stay home. And if you're around someone vulnerable, be careful. The other day, the CDC director told us we can put our masks in a drawer. Hawaii will be the last state to get rid of mandates later this month. Democratic Governor David Ige says we care about our community and we are all willing to sacrifice to keep each other healthy and safe. But Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a Republican who fought against mandates, tells Fox it is political theater. They're doing it for the appearance. They're not doing it because it's having any meaningful medical impact. What does Dr. McCary think about the future for masking? You look at what was happening in Asia. They got burned by SARS in the past, and they've had other outbreaks before we've really had to deal with them. They highly encourage, and it's well accepted, that if there's an active outbreak, almost everybody will be wearing a mask in a public indoor setting. And if you have any risk factor, you may choose to want to wear one yourself. And if you've been around someone who's had the infection and you're concerned, you'll wear one. So I think we'll see that sort of selective masking policy live on. The problem is the worst thing you can do in public health is insist on something beyond when it's necessary. And we've done that. We're doing it right now with cloth masks and kids, low quality mask, almost of no benefit. And we're asking kids to wear it beyond the period when the infection has passed through the area. So which what we're doing is we're polarizing people around a public health intervention that could be effective in the future. You talk about kids. There's been a lot of focus also on the mental strain for them, also for adults. I mean, this this pandemic has taken a toll on on the psychology of of a lot of Americans. And, 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 you know, people were staying at home. They were working at home for a long time. And it's not easy to necessarily go back to normal with a flick of a switch. How, How big a deal, in your opinion, is the mental aspect of COVID? I think it's a huge deal, and I think it's one we're going to have a lot of regrets about because we put the entire country on this mission to stop all virus transmission at any cost. And the reality is people don't just die from viral replication. They die from hopelessness and from poverty and from a sense of their livelihoods being taken away. So we saw a 30,000 death increase in substance abuse in year one of the pandemic. We don't have the numbers for year two yet. We are seeing suicides that can only be explained by kids being shut out of school. And we're seeing cognitive delays and declines. Talk to a speech pathologist, talk to a high, high school guidance counselor. We're seeing now problems that we are just beginning to understand. For example, in Baltimore City, where I practice medicine, there were a number of kids when the schools went virtual that never logged on. And then when the schools went in person, they never showed up. These are children lost to the system entirely under the fallacy that, oh, you know, you can learn virtually and it'll be okay. We've got to find those people and rescue them. There was a lot of talk also about something that people have not fully understood, and that's the long haul. There are long haulers, people who didn't really get over COVID. I was talking to a coworker who said they were speaking to somebody who still can't taste after getting COVID months later. So th- that aspect of it, is it still a mystery to you or are you learning more? No, it's still a mystery. I think to most physicians, we have seen long haul symptoms after other infections. If you look at uh, dengue fever or even influenza, we know that those long haul symptoms are proportional to how severe and how long you were sick with the virus. And we see them also Um, In children with COVID, for example, the long haul symptoms are identical to that seen with other viruses that's been studied and published in The Lancet. 
We don't really know what's happening. There's a theory that your antibodies are maybe crossing over and maybe attacking some of the neurologic system. There is really no effective treatment that I've heard of and I've asked a lot of people. And there's a lot of money being thrown at it. In my opinion, we probably won't get much out of that investment in research. We did learn, especially in Omicron, that being vaccinated certainly wasn't the shield we'd hoped, that people still got COVID. It wasn't as strong and it was milder, but you still got infected. Are we in for more rounds of boosters, in your view, over the course of years to come? It really depends on the variants that come about. For So, for example, let's say that a new variant is discovered next fall or in three years. Both are very possible scenarios. We may see that the current immunity works a little bit. It gives you some partial protection, but that for those particularly high risk, namely older folks, that a variant specific booster may really protect them. I don't think it's the influenza model where you come in every year for a a seasonal specific uh, strain. But regardless, whatever we deal with in the future, We are, in your view, we should live more of a normal way we did even before the pandemic and just deal with COVID as it comes. Is that the way it should be from now forward? The second we hear hear about a new virus, we've got to move our researchers immediately to study it, not just in the lab, but study the epidemiology statistics. That is, who's dying? What are the risk factors? Um, How long are you contagious for? When are you shedding the virus the most? Do masks work? Is it surface transmission or is it aerosolized? Those are basic clinical research experiments we did not do with COVID early on. And as a result, we debated those answers for months, even for some over the entire two year period. We still don't have the exact origin of this outbreak. We know it came out of China and Wuhan. Do you think we'll ever know? I think we have as much information now as we will ever have, but we're not going to discover a scrap lab notebook in the Wuhan lab if we send our people over there. We're not going to get a confession from a lab worker who's willing to risk the lives of their entire family back in China. And as I told Harris Faulkner in April of 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was an infected lab worker that was patient zero that went over to the Wuhan hospital five miles away and got treated, that was the epicenter. It's very obvious, everything points to that. There's been other viral lab leaks in China in the past. And so I think we have all the information we're going to need to have. People want to know the origins to have closure. We've lost a tremendous amount of lives worldwide and people want a sense of closure. Dr. Marty McCary, Johns Hopkins professor, Fox News contributor, author of The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. As always, great to talk to you. Thank you. Good to be with you, Dave. Thank you. This is Carol Markowitz with your Fox News commentary coming up. Inflation has hit a 40-year high again. Consumer prices up nearly 8% for the 12 months ending in February. And that does not include the most recent surge in gas prices, which were up 38% year over year, but have spiked more as the fighting continues in Ukraine. Yes, it is accurate that um, the invasion by President Putin into Ukraine has impacted global inflation, inflation in the United States. The White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki continues to get pushback from Republicans who say the president's policies have also fueled inflation. The bottom line is more pain for consumers as the cost of just about everything goes up. And that's true for restaurants, too, like taco chain Buena Onda, dealing with the rising cost of avocados. When it gets too expensive, I think people are just not going to buy it. We can't sell a bowl of guacamole for $20. As of December, the Labor Department showed higher costs for eating at home were slightly outpacing the rising cost of eating away from home. But high inflation is yet another challenge for an industry that had enough on its plate already after two years of pandemic restrictions. It's definitely impacting. I do the buying for a retail market, a wholesale operation, 
and a 300-seat restaurant. Ted Hammerman is better known as Mr. Fish, which is the name of his business, a fish market and restaurant in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And then um, I'm also partnered up with another fellow, and we import full container loads of seafood products from Vietnam, from Tunisia. I was in Tunisia in November and October. The reason for that is to fill in the gaps because, you know, seafood is global and we have a very limited resource in America. We're also very smart with controlling and quoting our resources. So I'm guessing that fish is really sort of the biggest item in your itinerary when you go shopping, if you will, for all of your businesses. Um, Yes. So can you give us an example of, you know, this much fish used to cost this and now it's costing this last summer on an average on fresh fish i was buying between 20 dollars of fresh fish a week now that same amount of fish has gone up across the board dollar fifty to two dollars a pound the freight last year was 30 cent a pound now it's 33 cents a pound and it's going to go up to a half a buck very, very soon. So when you say freight, are you talking about, because I'm thinking also about you've got transportation costs as well, correct? Well, sure. And that, you got to keep in mind, if you buy a grouper and me as a wholesaler, I'm paying eight bucks a pound for that grouper. That's a whole round grouper gutted and on ice fresh coming out of Florida or Costa Rica or even locally. If it's a, uh, below Charleston, then we put it on a freight truck. You're still going to pay 33 cents a pound. When it hits your dock, you just paid $8.33 a pound. When you cut that fish and you throw half of them away because only half is usable, because in America we don't eat the heads as other countries do. So I got $16.66 a pound in that fish, in that filet, before I pay labor, before I pay electric overhead and uh, all the other miscellaneous taxes that I pay. So, yeah, we want to be sustainable as well as a business. So to do that, you got no one to hold them, no one to fold them. You got to roll the punches. And uh, freight is, you know, years back, freight was, eh, it costs a dime a pound, no biggie. You know, you can eat that. Now, it's an integral part of your business. So... I mean, today I bought everything from French fries to hush puppy mix. And it all plays into moving you from point A to point B. Right. So you're saying that's affecting not just the transportation of the fish, but it's being folded into higher prices for really everything that you're buying. And really, granted, uh, the fisherman, when he goes out, for instance, uh, the fisherman, we're in a bay, long bay. So it's 30 miles before they can even think about wetting a hook. And uh, they're burning X amount of fuel to get to where they need to start fishing. Now that fuel costs them a dollar more a gallon, and it's going up on a daily basis. So it all gets figured into that equation where that $8 fish by, I would suggest, if this keeps on going the way it is, will be $9 in a couple of weeks. So is this what your distributors are saying to you, that it's really the gas prices having the biggest impact? Or were you already seeing these prices for everything from the fish to the French fries rising even before yes. the gas gas prices really started to spike? Well, it's caused that hysteria and it's caused that opportunity for profit making, too. So, I mean, in some cases, it's definitely it's warranted. It's costing more. Wow. Are you concerned that rising gas prices and inflation in general is going to make people less likely to go out to eat in order to save money? It causes other things to rise. I mean, beef, we sell beef as well. Beef is a prime example. As soon as the pump started going up, the beef prices went up. Were they giving the farmers anymore? That's very debatable. And uh, if you look at JBS which is the biggest meat producer almost in the world, actually, because they're they're in Europe, but they're based in Iowa. I mean, they've had such corporate profits. I mean, they've handed out the executive board just 
They all bought super yachts, you know. They're farting in silk, as they say. Meat is one of the industries the White House has singled out, suggesting too much power for a handful of companies is one driver of high prices. And when he announced a ban on Russian energy this week, President Biden blamed rising gas prices on Putin's war. But he had this message for oil and gas companies and their financial backers. It's no excuse to exercise excessive price increases or padding profits or any kind of effort to exploit this situation. For restaurants, this inflation wave could be crushing after so many pandemic disruptions, from the initial round of shutdowns through the Delta and Omicron surges after what felt like a promising spring last year. That was pretty bad. The restaurant really suffered. We closed it, but the market did extremely well because people didn't want to go to restaurants, but, you know, they wanted to satiate that urge for a fried oyster we make a uh, fried green tomato soft crab tower. And they say, oh, man, I wish I had that. So they'll call in a to-go order and they'll come pick it up or we'll bring it out to their car, masked up and gloved up. So, yeah, through the eyes of adversity, then go I. How much more can you as a businessman take if the prices of what you're buying continues to go up, if your distributors continue to charge more? Well, it's a good point. Th- these are inflationary times like we've never seen. And we had to reprint the menu. We reprinted last year because we did a, a, a COVID menu. And then we reprinted again a couple of weeks ago, and it's coming out now, to reflect what's happening inflationary-wise. I mean, scallops. I mean, my God, the scallops uh, cost me $250 a gallon. That's eight pounds. You know, I mean, this is nuts. You talk about luxury food. Maybe if you, you're a stockbroker and you just knocked your bits on Bitcoin, you can afford it. But the normal schmo who comes to Myrtle Beach who, who wants a, a plate of seafood, it's not affordable. What did scallops used to cost you? What did that gallon of scallops used to cost? Well, I'm going to get some today. The really big ones, the U10s and U12s, are costing me between 250 today and then six months ago they were about 150 160. wow so i mean yes it's a very regulated fishery but scallops is a prime example shrimp is still at a norm it's not like it was years ago where it was a luxury food because we import more than what we process here in america but that's why we had to reprint the menu Ted, what's it going to take to have an actual return to normalcy? And are we talking months or years? Well, well, looking at the big picture, once the pandemic hit and the the American labor started getting those $920 checks per week, and and from there it kept getting extended in another extension, and then there was extended unemployment, which is still happening today. So what it did was not only create a superfluous society of complacency, but all of a sudden, where's the American worker? That $10 an hour worker now wants 15 or else he'll go to the Hilton who's starting people at 17. The hospitality industry is the one that suffered the biggest that I can see. The specialized trades then not so much, but I mean, they're all hurting for people, for bodies. So between all that, during the pandemic times, yeah, they had money for expendable goods, but did they want to come back to work? No, until it was absolutely necessary. Now, again, looking at the big picture, you've got your labor, your basic labor, who working for you for years for, say, for $12, $13 an hour. Now he wants 17 or else he walks. All right, so you've got to make concessions. All right, and throw that in with $250 a gallon scallops and $4.20 it was this morning gasoline, we have to sustain as well. You know, and, and then again, there's an expression, you don't, you don't make money in your business on a daily basis, you make it on a yearly basis. Well, during that year, you still have to survive. 
And you got to pay your bills. You got to pay your taxes. You got to pay your unemployment taxes. My God, my workman's comp almost doubled. My auto, I'm running four autos, uh, two refrigerated trucks, the bus, and then and a pickup on the road. And that's $8,500 a year in insurance, vehicle insurance. I mean, we were normally paying 2800 you see. And so everything is commensurate. It's crazy. Well, we wish you a lots of continued success in the long run ted hammerman otherwise known as mr fish in myrtle beach <laughs> south carolina thank you so much for your time i want to leave something with the listeners you can't remember you can't live on wishes but you can live on fishes <laughs> ted thank you so much thank you Download Fox News Channel's The Five podcast for free. Five of your favorite Fox News personalities discuss current issues in a roundtable discussion. Get it now on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and foxnewspodcasts.com. Subscribe to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. A trip to a famed Jersey Shore restaurant sent one couple home with more than just leftovers. Michael Spressler and his wife Maria have been going to the Lobster House since the 80s. And during a recent visit, he says he grew concerned when he felt something hard in his food. NJ.com reports that Michael was having his usual appetizer of a dozen oysters on the half shell, complete with a little hot sauce, cocktail sauce, and lemon, when he thought one of his teeth had cracked. It turned out to be a perfectly round white pearl instead. His wife says she'd like to keep the pearl, which measures almost nine millimeters across and maybe have it set in a ring or a necklace. But Michael says he's more interested in finding out what it's worth. He says nothing like this has ever happened to him before, and he's been told it could be worth thousands of dollars, depending on the body of water it came from. Good luck, Michael. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Carol Markowitz. What's on your mind? Everyone remembers the last activities they did before the world shut down in March 2020. Mine was attending my friend's beautiful wedding in Aruba and hearing from family back home that all the activities around the Jewish holiday of Purim had been canceled. I wasn't shocked that the pandemic was hitting our shores. A month earlier, my brother-in-law, who lives in Asia, was sending pictures of the temperature check to get into his office building. We're all going to get this thing, he told us. We got home from the wedding, pulled our kids from school, and went straight into lockdown. While we reminisce on the before times, it's equally important to recall the beliefs that had been shattered by these two COVID-19 years. I was a small government conservative, sure, but I somehow still believed in our health agencies. I was certain our health officials had spent decades preparing for a pandemic such as this. They would lead the way on sharing information between countries, carefully discarding information from totalitarian regimes like China, and would prioritize returning us to normal as soon as possible. In retrospect, it's crazy that I had such faith. I didn't think I was naive, but it turns out I was. I was raised on the Ronald Reagan quote, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, end quote. And still, I believed this was important. This was their moment to shine. They couldn't let us down now. They did not shine. They did let us down. From locking us all down to frequently providing conflicting information and lying that the quote science had quote changed, our health agencies were a complete disaster. The leaders at the agencies, Dr. Rochelle Walensky at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National Institutes of Health, either straight out bungled any task or comment or simply lied to us. This isn't about the fog of the pandemic, the spring of 2020. This is to the present day. As late as November 2021, Walensky was alleging that masking was at least 80% effective in stopping all viruses. That would be miraculous if true. It is not true. There has not been a single study that showed masking to be an effective way of stopping COVID-19, let alone the common cold. 
And yet right now in New York City, toddlers are masked because of the broken and unscientific policies pushed by these organizations. Fauci would go on TV and be led along by the interviewer. In an April 2021 interview with Savannah Guthrie on the Today Show, Guthrie asked about the recent loosening of masking guidance and why her child still had to mask according to guidance while she did not. Fauci assured her that children would get vaccinated soon and would be able to unmask then. But here's the kicker. There was no new guidance exempting children from removing their masks outdoors. Guthrie had gotten it wrong and Fauci simply went along with it. Both Fauci and Walensky would destroy the faith Americans like me had in our health agencies. They did not conduct themselves or the agencies to the benefit of us all, only to the benefit of their political allies. Americans will never again simply follow what health agencies tell them. We need agencies to tell us the truth in times of crisis. We need agencies that reach sane and rational conclusions and don't foment hysteria. These agencies are not what we have. This is Carol Markowitz. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, download and listen to Everyone Talks to Liz. Fox Business's Liz Clayman talks with entrepreneurs and executives about inspiring and motivational stories. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com.